I speak to English, so it's my pleasure to have you here, Mashik, and uh, Nicola will tell you uh, and introduce you, Mashik, and uh, possibly his talk for tonight. And all this. Yes, sir, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Mashik, from so um, we met with Maciek at Weizmann Institute of Science when we worked together on values topologically, uh, topological phases of matter. And Maciek was previously at Weizmann and then he moved to Zurich as a postdoc. And coming to Maciek has like a, was a broad agenda of interesting topics that he worked on. And one, particularly one of these is the physics of machine learning. And we 
uh, we have this fortunate thing of running one of the projects, a common project, and he will be talking about how to use physics to actually uh, optimize hyperparameters for uh, in neural networks. And so, my pleasure to welcome you. Okay, thanks a lot. It's a, it's a pleasure to be again in, in Lviv. Uh, maybe some of you have been around last summer with the data science group, but not. Uh, we have a second chance to see a bit of physics in, in machinery. So this talk is, is going to be about um, well, trying to bring some physical insights to, to the field of, of machine learning to, well, it's not like there aren't, but you know, this is our little contribution, uh, to try to improve training of particular kinds of neural networks. So something, something quite generic. Uh, and, and before we dive into any details, I, I want to acknowledge my, my collaborators, right? So, you know, Mikko, I probably uh, know, He's uh, uh, in his former life a physicist. Well, he's a little bit of a physicist still. He still still publishes in, in physics, but as you know, he's a director of our here at SoftServe. And uh, it's also done with, in collaboration with two guys, but apparently are a little bit more private because we couldn't pull their uh, photos uh, online. So this is a, a Vlad Pushkarov and Anil Nefron from, from, from Technion, from, from Israel. And I specifically want to acknowledge Vlad. Vlad is a master's student and uh, he has done pretty much all the coding on, on this project and, and, and all the running of, of the simulations, and that was uh, quite a bit. So, you know, well, credits were credits are due. Um, so the outline of this talk is as follows. I'll, I'll begin by giving you a sort of a brief, uh, very short in, intro overview of, of the relations between physics and machine learning. Uh, it's a little bit more of, of, of a justification why, uh, uh, why a physicist is actually you know, standing here and talking to you about any machine learning in the first place. Uh, and then I'll uh, go to, um, to define the problem. So uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, you know how you can sort of on a, on a technical level understand what what a model training is and and conceptually how it differs from from choosing hyperparameters. Uh, then uh, uh, I'll I'll try to show you uh, some intuition. It's it's basically the key physical intuition in 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 this uh, in this uh, work. That is that that one can understand certain. Uh, hyperparameters that one that one chooses when when one trains a model, as uh, as uh, controlling somehow the smoothness of the landscape in which the training happens, and and with that understanding we'll try to build an, an algorithm. This algorithm is is actually not something that is you know completely new. It's an algorithm which is actually known in in physics and it's applied to, to certain kinds of problems, mostly things like uh, simulation of, of complicated spin systems and, and protein folding. It's called replica exchange method. And we'll basically try to use this, this insight that we have about the smoothness of the landscape and this algorithm which is used in, in you know, quite different contexts to actually improve the, the training of those, uh, uh, so the, the choice of those hyperparameters. And then, so that doesn't uh, look in the end like, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just theory and some equations. I'll try to show you some, uh, some numerical results. So we did, we did, you know, and we didn't, Vlad did implement this, this, this algorithm. And, and, and he made it work, uh, so we have some <laughs> results to uh, show you. Uh, yeah, conclusions are look whatever. Okay, so, so uh, you know, why, why physics? Why, why, why should there be any relation between machine learning and physics? So, you know, again, for the guys who have been during the data science school, like, I, I'll give a very brief uh, recap of this. So, it, the relation between physics and machine learning actually have a fairly long history. I would say that, that physics is historically present from, from the very, uh, you know, ver very beginnings. If you look at at people who have actually worked on, on uh, machine learning pro uh, problems. A lot of them uh, are from you know, physical backgrounds and, and those connections basically go to er, you know, early 80s. But, but you know, that sort of historical perspective is, isn't really justifying much. So what I would want to uh, um, give a brief impression of is that you know, this relation kind of goes both ways. And what, what physics does is uh, uh, it provides certain kinds of you know, ideas, concepts, formalisms that can be used in, in the field of machine learning. So things like for instance, you know, thinking of the cost function as an energy of, of some landscape or thinking about things like, like entropy or, or things like this, correlations. Those are very physical concepts and they are developed because physics deals with, uh, you know, trying to understand behaviors of, uh, you know, very difficult uh, systems, right? So physics is, is actually this very funny discipline, uh, uh, you know, contrary to mathematics, in which we mostly deal with systems which are too difficult to really solve. Like we, we actually don't solve almost anything Exactly, but nevertheless, we, we gained a lot of you know deep understanding about the behavior of of those systems, system, at least of the, the the sort of the relevant aspects, and 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 the way physics does it 
is, you know, it has a certain uh, um, repertoire of, of techniques and tools that are specifically developed for this, uh, uh, you know, for, for this task. And one, one of them, for instance, is this idea, which is actually uh, something that, that engineers don't do much, which is, which is toy models. So, so, so physicists, when, when, when we try to analyze some, uh, 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 you know, complicated problem, what, you know, engineers often try to solve the problem in, in full difficulty, right? Because who cares if, you, if you're solving something simplified? You, you want to solve the real life problem. But, but this is usually they don't want to solve anything. We want to just understand things. So in order to understand things, we, 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 we are very sort of adept at, at producing reduced versions of the problem, stripping away all the details, just leaving the, the essence of what's this interesting phenomenon in it. And now the model that, that we might obtain you know, can look actually very contrived at the end, but it's, but it's actually capturing you know, the essence. So physicists have this idea of, of constructing methodically toy models. So that's something that you know, physics can also bring to machine learning. And most importantly, physics has actually tools, like mathematical tools to deal with, uh, you know, with, with those concepts and those problems. So that's what can, you know, physics can and, and you know, has brought to, to machine learning. But in recent years, there's, there's also sort of you know, a little bit of giving back. So, so machine learning uh, is, is being employed again. So phys physics you know, gives concepts, but machine learning gives tools, right? Machine learning these days has uh, been able to provide some methods, for example, for approximating probability distributions or um, uh, you know, approximating complicated functions, which can be used for physical problems. Things which we, let's say, were not able to solve before, now we can try to use methods from machine learning. And also it's, it's you know, not every uh, problem in, in physics really requires you to understand every, every single detail. Sometimes, for example, in experimental uh, uh, design, you, you want to synthesize the material with this, you know, those particular properties, and you actually don't, you don't really care exactly how that happened, but you want material of those properties. So for example, for this kind of, uh, you know, design of things, ma machine learning can be also very useful. So in order so that it's not so completely vague, let me, let me show you a few applications of, uh, of machine learning to, to physics. Th this is going to be very brief, uh, but, you know, perhaps the, the first thing that people did is, you know, they realized that, that uh, there are all those methods for, uh, you know, discriminating images and, and you know, analyzing data uh, that, that are, you know, very successful, let's say, in the last five, ten years in machine learning. So what they did is they tried to apply this to physical problems. So, for example, you get raw physical data of some sort, you know, this could be measurements of some particle positions or, or some energy spectra. And you try to understand at this point with machine learning methods, can I, can I tell, for example, which phase the system is in? Can I, can I say if it's magnetized, if, if, if it's thermalized? Can I, can I predict its, its, its physical properties just you know, based on that, okay? So, so people did this to some extent successfully, and some of those works were even able to sort of predict new conceptual things with this, okay? There, there isn't really that much of it, uh, but you know, people are trying. Then, then there is actually this, this other thing, which is, uh, machine learning methods as, as you know, useful approximating tools. So for instance, there's, you know, physicists actually, you know, some people say that quantum is very cool, but like 75% of modern physics or 90% or of modern physics is quantum. And, and, you know, quantum systems are ubiquitous, but nevertheless, it's very difficult to simulate them, right? So, so we need very efficient methods to, to solve those numerical problems that come from simulating quantum uh, systems. And one of the ideas is that, that some, uh, some, uh, approximations for quantum wave functions can be obtained by using machine learning methods. So there is a very, a very interesting paper from, um, from the group of Matthias Troyer. He's now one of head people at, uh, at this quantum computing effort of, of Microsoft. Uh, and they proposed using uh, essentially RBMs, as I suppose a lot of you are familiar with, like restricted Boltzmann machines, to try to approximate certain kinds of wave functions. And you know, they, they made some mileage out of, out of that. Uh, Another one, which is this kind of much more practical approach, is that that you know physical setups are often very you know very complicated. Like if you go to see uh, a, you know an actual experiment in, in a sort of you know good lab, you'll see that it's a very very complicated setup in which you tune many things in order to achieve uh, uh, you know certain behavior. And and normally this is done either manually or or for example there are some sort of algorithmic heuristics that one uses to do that. But of course you know, ultimately this is just a little step on the road. You don't really need to understand exactly how it works. So again, people try to use machine learning methods to kind of optimize those things and it does work. And finally, I think, which is perhaps the most interesting and the most relevant for this talk, it's this kind of, you know, this, this reverse direction where, you know, you try to apply things which are developed in physics for uh, problems which originate in, in machine learning. And perhaps the best uh, result to, you know, to, to in this direction 
are those works on tensor networks, right? So tensor networks, which are also known as tensor trains in, uh, uh, in sort of pure, pure machine learning methods, are actually methods which are developed like in the early 90s in physics to simulate quantum 1D systems. And they have been super successful in, in doing this. But you know, people who have uh, spent you know career doing this have actually, actually realized that they are much more flexible. They can be used also in problems which do not originate in physics, like classification problems. So for example, there are guys in, um, in New York, in, in Flatiron Institute, who, uh, you know, there's even a package, right? That's, That's just basically a form of knowledge. So, yes, so, so maybe there's something already in, in, in TensorFlow. So you can, you can try to deploy such, such tensor networks to whatever machine learning project uh, uh, you're doing. And there are a lot of things that they can be also used for generative uh, uh, modeling. And finally, there's kind of like this most theoretical aspect, which is, you know, there are machine learning models and you might just try to understand why, for instance, this deep neural network, you know, learns or, or doesn't, you know, why, why it needs so much data to converge. So, so there is, uh, you know, so this is basically something which is in the domain of statistical physics. And I would say that actually it's, it's a very French uh, kind of uh, area. So there's, there, are, there are statistical physicists mostly from, from France, from the group of like uh, Marc Mazar and, and, and Mathilde Biroli, uh, you know, Julio Biroli and, and Lenka Zdeborova, who are actually analyzing those, those problems in, in detail. Why, why a certain kind of architecture, you know, has a chance to converge, okay? So that's more or less, you know, what, what physics is, is doing currently with machine learning. So, so now let's, let's try to understand what, what we're going to do. So we're going to be talking about training or, uh, neural networks, right? Or, or some machine learning models. And depending on like how familiar you are with the field, you know, that there can be various level of abstraction that you can, you can deploy. So like, if you actually don't know anything, so this is like a really cool area and then you draw like a, some neuron that's biologically inspired, whatever, right? But if, you, but if you actually ever try to train any machine learning model, then you realize that actually it sort of looks more like that, right? So there is, there is a bunch of layers, there's, there's a lot of parameters, then you have to play with them and then you have to train, it, right? So we need to some, have, you know, but, but again, this is too concrete, right? We, we, you know, we don't want to, for the moment, talk about details of any particular architecture. So we need some sort of intermediate level that we can discuss sort of slightly more abstractly. And then intermediate level is, is this, right? So what we have is, and at least in a supervised learning kind of setting, we, we have a, 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 some data set, there are some samples which are, which are labeled, right? And we have some model which is parameterized by this weight vector W. And the W may be all the, all the weights of all the, all the layers, everything that's in the model, okay? And the task is, of course, to try to uh, fix the, the weights W in such a way that your model uh, is, is doing what it's supposed to do, predicting the labels Y for, uh, for, for new points. So how do you do it? Well, you define something like a loss function, right? Something which parameterizes how far away for a given sample, your model at the given you know, values of weights is from actually giving you, know, the, you the answers that you want, right? And then you construct some sort of empirical cost function, which is effectively this, this average error, right? And now you can ask, neglecting, Neglecting all the other choices, like for example, uh, choosing the number of layers and things like this, like how will I, you know, how do I go about uh, uh, finding my weights, right? So you know that the, the sort of the most obvious and, uh, and, and actually naive way to do it is you basically just con construct a gradient descent equation, right? You basically say, well, let me, let me, let me evaluate the outcomes of the network on, on those data sets. Let me see what it tells me and, you know, let me compare it to the, uh, the answer that I want and, and let me change the weights in the direction so that the, the answers are closer to what, it, what they should be, right? And so why do, you, why do we call this, this thing a naive way to do it, right? It's a naive way because, you know, you, I guess it's a law of the field, so, so you know that uh, this, this landscape, this cost function, energy function, whatever you call it, is actually very complicated, right? So, so you can immediately predict that perhaps you're not going to be able to find some good minimum, right? Because you know, this, this gradient descent equation is going to end up in some, some little value, okay? So, so this may be already a problem, but there's actually a more fundamental problem, right? Which is that perhaps, you know, this is actually not exactly what you want, right? Because what you really want is, is that, is not to find, let's say, the, the, you know, the best value in that, in that potential landscape, but you want that your model generalizes well. Actually, you don't care really about this, right? What you really care is that if you show it new data, which you haven't trained it on, then it's still doing well, okay? And then, uh, well, so, so the, there is, you know, there could be hypothesis, right, that we can pose that, that perhaps those two things are, are related, you know, perhaps you're not, you know, like, if you do it like this, your model will most certainly not generalize well, right? And now you can ask a question, well, maybe, why, why is it not generalizing well? 
maybe it's not generalizing well because you know precisely you're stuck in one of those those local minima. Maybe maybe this is your problem. If if you only find the, the you know this deep local minimum, then you'll be doing fine. Okay, but then you have this empirical observation that you can definitely improve uh, your generalization by using various form of, of what people call uh, uh, regularization, right? So so what are those regularizations? So so these are those are things like for example adding adding noise in the training. So adding noise either to the data set or adding noise to the weights or adding noise to the gradients. Things like, for instance, instead of evaluating this, those gradients exactly, doing a batch, a batch gradient evaluation. Or for instance, doing the procedure like early stopping. So, so you know, don't, don't, don't train the model to saturation, finish earlier, right? Or using dropouts, right? So, so Everybody's familiar with things like this, yeah. So, so for example, you can you know you can use dropout, right? So, so you 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 randomly freeze certain parts of networks, right, during the training, and, and it sort of it, it alternates during the training, or you you actually just do uh, norms, right? You you modify your cost function by by adding let's say L1 or L2 norm, or you do batch normalization, and there are many other things that you can do, right? They all go under the name of regularization, and you know that empirically they improve you know they improve generalization. So so you know what's the uh, what's the deal? So, so why does why does regularization supposed to to help generalization? Okay, so hypothesis that we post maybe we're trapped in bad local minima, right? Maybe that's what's happening, and and what they do is they, they help us get away from uh, from from the bad local minima. So wh why why would that be the case? Well, if so, so let's let's focus on the on the case of adding noise, and I'll try like the noise will be prominent in this talk, so I'll try to map a lot of things to noise later. So, so if I add, for example, noise to to uh, to my uh, gradients, then instead of this this uh, you know uh, gradient descent equation, I have a stationary Langevin equation, right? So my, my system is moving is moving down in some potential landscape, but there is a random force which you know which gives it, which, which gives it a kick right so so you you, you imagine the sentence a potential landscape but occasionally I can get a kick and what's uh, what's important is that let's say in, in this case of the larger equation this is a white noise so so the so the kicks that you get are completely not correlated once you can get a little bit kick direction in this direction once in something else right and and the strength of the noise is parameterized by by, by this value t okay so so that's that more tells you like if I if I if I play with t I play with how strong the noise is okay so so what is interesting about this the, the interesting thing is that at long times if you if you initialize if you prepare an ensemble of the system so you know initialize million copies of your system with some random initial weights and then let it you know perform the evolution according to to this equation under this noise with strength t. The distribution of your endpoints, where you ended up in the training, would be you know there is, there is some there is some probability distribution of, of your endpoints, and that distribution is actually given by a Boltzmann distribution. Okay, so the, and it's not a random Boltzmann distribution; it's a distribution that really has the, your cost function as the as the energy function, and the beta. There is some parameter beta, and it turns out that the beta is also not something completely accidental. Beta is exactly so beta which physically has the interpretation of, of you know one over temperature so so the Boltzmann distribution you know, Boltzmann distribution describes a thermal distribution of, of some you know some particles in some in some energy potential right so it turns out that if you do evolution if you do million copies of evolution according to the system you end up with outcomes according to this problem distribution with temperature precisely precisely governed by the strength of the noise so now you kind of understand that there is there is some connection where you can think of the noise that you add in your training as some form of temperature that governs, you know, the, the, the landscape in, in, you know, in which you behave yourself, in, in which you uh, find yourself, okay? And you can, okay, you, so, so, so one way you could, you could try to play with those things is you could, you could try to, to change this parameter during the training, right? That's the, you know, I, I, I assume that maybe you're familiar that sometimes you train a model and you anneal some parameters, right? So for, yes, no? So annealing means you basically, Let's say you have a learning rate in, in your model, and you don't keep the learning rate constant throughout the whole training, but, but, you, but you tune it down, right? So what would be the effect here? That would be basically trying to uh, reduce the noise throughout the training, but that would mean that you effectively reduce the temperature in your model. And that, that means that, that, basi that basically, you know, you let at, at high temperature, uh, or maybe, okay, maybe I'm learning my rate, basically any, any model, 
any energy landscape at, at high, if, if you if you tune the temperature high enough you you know it basically looks flat if 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 your particle has a lot of energy then it doesn't see the details of of any potential landscape if you if you have uh, you know low temperature then you can see every every little value right so 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 annealing procedures basically say well let's start at high temperature then i can move a lot in the landscape and then i tune the temperature down and then i kind of settle in in some particular minima so okay so so you know maybe you 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 can think okay it helps all those regularization help because somehow they you know they allow me to 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 perform this kind of annealing procedure where i settle in some good local minimum right but as we said already we don't necessarily we are not necessarily interested in the training of a machine learning model in finding the best local minimum of the cost function l right nobody ever told you that the best minimum of the cost function L is the one which will produce you the best, uh, you know, generalization uh, results, right? And 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 you know, some hint in this direction is that, for example, if you look at the one of the most successful ways to do that, to you know, to train, you know, okay, there, there are many things you can do on top of that, but basically, you almost always train stuff with stochastic gradient descent, right? So what is stochastic gradient descent? It's it's basically the same you were doing before. The weights are uh, updated according to you know the gradient of the cost function but you don't compute the gradients exactly, right? You compute it on batch, right? And choosing the batch, you know, there, there, is, some, there is some trade off in, 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 in choosing the batch. So for example, if you, if you make batches very small, then your gradients are, are very noisy, but you can compute them online. If you make batches very large, then, you know, you, you get exact gradients, but you, you know, you, you can then parallelize stuff nicely, okay? But normally you don't compute the gradients exactly. And there is an, an empirical observation. So normally batches are fairly small compared to the actual amount of data that you have. And the empirical observation is that so stochastic gradient descent is actually very good at finding solutions which generalize well, right? Even for, for very complicated, you know, complicated problems. And another piece of like information, it is highly unlikely that in this kind of noisy procedure, you're actually finding a global minimum, right? So, so you're, you're definitely finding something that generalizes well, and it's very unlikely that you're finding a global minimum, right? So, so that hints again in this direction that no, it's not about finding the, you know, the best uh, 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 local minimum. And you, know, you, you can make this a little bit more sort of quantitative. You can try to understand what are the statistics of the minima. If you take some landscape, what are the, the properties of, of the minima? And people actually found, so you can ask, for example, the question, if you believe that your model is not generalizing very well, because you're actually finding a bad local minimum. So what does it mean, bad? Bad, bad local minimum means, for example, that you, know, you believe that the bad local minima are, are the ones which are high, you know, like they, they are much higher in energy than the true minimum of the system. So, so you say, oh, I'm, I'm trapped in a bad local minimum because there is, there is a deep one somewhere, right? And then you can ask, okay, fine. So for a, for a real machine learning model, how likely are bad local, not, not how likely is that you enter, but just how likely they are. In the, in the landscape, the lots of minima, how many are bad? How many, how many local minima are actually far away in energy from the global minimum, okay? And then you actually realize that the answer is totally unlikely. And, and why, why, why is that the case? It's, it's, it's because actually, you know, we, we have those pictures in our, in our head that when, when, we, when we think about the landscape, that are like little potential values, but we kind of, you know, we, can only think of, you know, we imagine 3D world, and when you think of potentials, you kind of see 2D potentials, like little egg box type potentials, you know, like little valley here, little valley here, little valley here. But of course, we're not talking about problem being solved in 2D. We're talking about problem being solved, let's say, in a, in a let's say, million, you know, it's a million dimensional space where every, every spatial, spatial directory is, is one of the parameters of the network, right? So we're talking about potentials in million dimensional space. So now you ask, how many, how many critical points, right? like in a mathematical sense, how many critical points are actually minima. So you realize that, oh, if, if, I, if I compute like the matrix of second derivative, like Hessian of, of this, right, then I need to have all my eigenvalues positive that, so that it is actually a minimum. So I, let's say my, 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 my million eigenvalues, right, have to be positive so that it's a minimum. If only one of them is not positive, then I have a, a direction which just makes it into a, like a subtle point, right? So, so actually, you know, analysis kind of tells you that, that it's exponentially unlikely that the minimum, which is not very close to, be, to the global minimum, is found. Like almost everything, every critical point that you find slightly higher energy is, is most probably a subtle point, okay? So you're, you're not getting stuck in the, low, in, in, the, in the bad, energetically bad local minima. That's not, that's not the problem if you're not 
uh, not generalizing. And people, so, so this is kind of theoretical analysis from something called random matrix theory, but uh, which again is it's very interesting. This was originally devised also in physics to study nuclear physics, but okay. But people also tried this on actual neural networks, right? So, so what people did is, is they, they, trained, they trained networks of uh, various sizes. So this is a, a bunch of like, I, I actually don't remember exactly what is the parameter. There's some, some, some parameter related to the number of neurons in the net. And they said, okay, let me try the, train the network, let's say you know, 10,000 times, and let me see at the distribution of the loss functions, like my end result, what, my, what is my final loss? You know? And you see that if the network is small, you get a very broad distribution of losses, right? So sometimes your, your loss is very bad, sometimes your loss is very good. But the, the bigger the network grows, meaning the, the more dimensional this, this, this space is, the more clustered they are, right? So, so effectively, almost all your, your, your simulations end up being, you know, you know fairly well clustered. You're not ending up, this, this can be you're ending up in a bad local minima, far away from, from, from the true. But in a big network, you never end up really far away from, you know, in energy from the, from the, uh, from the uh, global minimum. And, and here is something else, here is the statistics. If you look at the, at the places where you ended up, this is the statistics of your, uh, you know, eigenvalues of the Hessian, like how much, uh, you know, uh, the point you ended up, how much uh, is it a, a minimum, how much is it's, it's actually a, a, a subtle point, right? So basically you, you realize that, that you end up in minima and those minima are also close in energy to the global minima. So, so you know it's, you know, there's, there's something sort of more interesting happening there, okay? Uh, right, and now, wait, wait, wait. And now, now basically you could, you could approach it two ways, right? One of it is, you know, theoretically. You, one of it is you could say, well, as a, as a physicist, as a theorist, as I don't know, computer scientist, I can, I can now go and let's say study the properties of stochastic gradient descent or, or some, some other aspect of this, you know, in, in, in large detail and try to understand why. The other aspect is, is sort of more engineering. You, you could say, uh, can I, you know, with, with all the understanding that I have, can I, can I actually try to design a procedure which, which somehow makes it better, you know, which, which, which allows you to, to generalize better, right? So this is what we're going, you know, what, what we're trying to do. So, so we're now, now we're actually discussing, you know, this, this question of, okay, how do I choose the hyperparameters of your model? So for the moment we tried, we, we talked only about the weights, right? And somehow we, we, we never mentioned the fact that in your model, you make a lot of choices. Some of them are architectural, right? Like, like choosing the number of layers and you know, connections and things like this. And actually, we're not going to talk about that. And some of them are uh, related to, you know, to choosing other, other parameters that you use in the training. Like, for instance, like things like, like learning rate, uh, uh, dropout rate, uh, strength of the regularization, things like this. So how do you, how do you choose this, right? So in, in some sense, that, you know, when you say that, that you train your model, Right? It's, it's, a, it's an illusion to say that it's only this great descent process, right? It ultimately, if you, somebody, if you give somebody a trained model, this trained model is a, is, a, is, a, you know, is a fixed network that arrived at this point by a combination of doing this gradient descent and by you choosing the correct hyperparameters, right? If you don't know how to choose the correct hyperparameters, you'll never get the performance they have you know, stated in some paper, right? So, so in some sense, model is the trained weights according to some hyperparameters, right? So how do, you, how do you do it? Well, conceptually, there is, you do it, so those two things, you do very differently, right? It's, it's like a double, double loop optimization, right? The, the one loop is that you choose fixed you know, hyperparameters, and then basically you let it evolve according to this gradient descent equation. And basically what you do is you, you look at the score, right? And then there's the, then there's the outer loop, right? Which is you, you examine the score, and you change the hyperparameters and you let it run again, right? And of course, you know, you can do it sort of very, in a very pedestrian way. You, you, can, you can do it, uh, you know, manually. But, but of, you know, in, in any sort of larger system, you, you have to have some methodical strategy to do it, right? So you, you run this, this hyperparameter optimization in some algorithmic way, right? So, so how can you do it? The, the simplest way you, you, you can do it is, you know, imagine that you do a grid search over those parameters, right? So why is this not a, not a great thing? It's, the problem is simply dimensionality, right? If you have more than, I don't know, two, three parameters, then you will not be able to efficiently explore that space, right? Another possibility is, is that you may basically perform just random search, you know, something like in the spirit of, of genetic algorithm, you simply may have luck and, and, and find, you know, some corner of this, of this space, which is good, which you, let's say, would have missed with, with the grid search, right? 
And finally, you can also do it slightly, slightly sort of in a more intelligent way, but it's actually computationally more costly, which is you actually look at those numbers and you try to ask like the next point that I'm going to try, let, let me, let me look, you, use those results that I've seen before. Let me see, well, in that corner, it was already pretty good. Let, let me not try just totally random stuff. Let me try close to here, right? So the sort of adaptive searches. But all of them have the same, what I want to kind of impress upon you, that they all of them have the same quality, which is that ultimately your final trained model will be the result of choosing a single of those parameters, the best one, and performing a gradient, let's say, descent in that, uh, you know, with, with that hyperparameter, right? And you kind of accept perhaps you know, using the information to, to get you to that last point, like you will never have used any computation that you used before to do anything, right? All those things are, are some, in some way discarded, right? So in a sort of more abstract way, you could think of it this way, that, that if the model is defined by the final values of weights and the final values of, of hyperparameters, right? Then, it, then, then really what you, what you do is you have this in, this, in this global space of weights, and hyperparameters, you're really choosing hyperplane, uh, sort of a plane which is defined by a fixed value of the of the you know of some hyperparameter, and this is this is the plane in which you do the gradient descent, right? And it doesn't have to be so, right? So so what what we're trying to to show you is that you actually can do it in such a way that you reuse the computations that you did before, or, or well, or rather that, that the computations are coupled, that they talk to each other throughout the process. Now. The, the, the conceptual uh, step from this is that you can, at the end of the day, you can never think about the model as, as you know, being characterized by a particular value of a, param of a hyperparameter, but instead it's, it's characterized by, by a certain path in, in the hyperparameter and weight space. So like your, your model is specified by the evolution, not according to a fixed hyperparameter in the weight space, but in a joint space of hyperparameters and weights, okay? And what, so we'll try to show you how you can do it with some physical techniques, and I'll try to, you know, show you numerical results which are supposed to show you that it works better than if you do it normally, okay? Fine, so, so, so what's, what's kind of the setup here? So, so the, all those methods that I described before, you, you can think that, you know, you, you have a bunch of, you know, you can, you can parallelize your, your, your hyperparameter, let's say, uh, selection process, so you have a bunch of, processors, GPUs, whatever, which run individual copies of your optimization problem for different values, and they all converge to a minimum somewhere. And, and you know, you just examine all of them and you choose the best. So what, what, what we're going to try to do is introduce a way for those simulations to talk to each other throughout the process, such that, that sort of, you know, each one of them is, 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 you know, tracing some trajectory in the space, which depends on its interaction with the other guys. And at the end of the day, you also choose the last, you know, the, the best guy, but the, guess, the, the, the best guy will have a trajectory, which is an effect of, of him talking to all the others too, all the way throughout the train. Okay. Um, right. So, uh, so now I wanted to give you this, this physical intuition. So, so, you know, how do we do it in, in practice? So let's go back to this energy landscape. And I actually already kind of, you know, maybe not very clearly, I sold you that intuition before. So what is, what is the, you know, the, I, I told you that if you train, that you end up with the distribution of, of your uh, outcomes, which is, which is given by this Boltzmann distribution. And there is some notion of temperature, right? So what is the effect of temperature? You know, if you think of it, temperature is, you know, the, the, the or inverse temperature beta, it's just multiplying your L, which is the energy function, right? So just a multiplicative factor. So, now, so, so you know, there is, there is some energy landscape. If I multiply it by a very small number, then it, everything will be very, you know, very flat. If I multiply it by a very big number, everything will be very big, right? You just, it's just a linear scale, right? So temperature, what it does is it really, like it's the same landscape at a different temperature looks like it has the same structure of, of you know, of valleys uh, uh, and, 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 and crests, but it's either deeper or flatter, right? Uh, okay, and we've, we've, also, we've also noticed that, uh, this, this temperature is actually somehow related to the strength of the noise in, 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 the, in the equation, right? Uh, yeah, okay, fine. So then, then comes the key idea. So you can think, you, you can convince yourself that many hyperparameters that you choose in the training of your model effectively introduce varying levels of noise in your system. And that noise 
maps to temperature. So effectively what happens is that not all, but I, I'll try to show you which ones, uh, or at least some of which ones, many hyperparameters that, that you choose actually can be thought of as controlling the level of smoothness of the effective landscape in which you actually train your model. So for example, let, let's say, let, you know, let, let's, let's give the, uh, well, learning rate, for instance, right? So if you, if you, for example, choose a large learning rate, right? So, so, so you know, you, you compute your gradient step and then you make a really large step, right? So most probably, you know, what can happen, right, is that you're, you're somewhere here and you're making, you know, your learning rate is really large. So you make a huge step, you end up somewhere else, right? And then, then the last thing you, you didn't end up here, you end up somewhere there. You compute another gradient, maybe it pushes you here, maybe it pushes somewhere else. So what it looks is, let's say, at large learning rate, it looks like you're doing gradient descent, but with really high noise. You're, you're basically jumping all over the place. And again, large noise, large temperature. But the same can be, the same can be said about batch. So, you know, like I, I give you intuitions that some of those things can be formalized. So for instance, Batch size is, is another parameter because you can you can you can show uh, you can show you can compute analytically what is the noise that is introduced by by playing with batch size in your system and you realize that okay this will not be white noise but the noise has a variance this this is this is the variance of, of the noise that noise has a variance and the variance of that of that noise scales as inverse batch size so again the you know, the, the smaller the batch size meaning the noise the gradient well the bigger the bigger variance of the noise the larger the temperature. The same way you can think about dropout. So if you if you think if you do dropout, right, you're not training exactly the network. You're training, you know, this iteration. You're training that subset of the network. That iteration you're training a different subset. Again, it looks like you're training the system in some very very noisy way. So dropout is another good candidate, right? Now another thing you could think of, for instance, is L2. So you can say, if I add if I add something like an L2 norm to my to my potential, L2 you know penalizes right like large weights. And effectively, it seems like it also you know doesn't doesn't want, you know, wants to flatten the, the, the landscape. So you may think L2 is a good candidate too, okay? And uh, actually I just, like, you know, literally today I just found a paper from, from uh, some guys from MIT which, uh, which analyze why batch normalization is a good thing. And it's, it's a paper from last year and they basically say that their thesis is actually, which they kind of seems like partly prove, partly simulate, is that batch normalization also effectively produces a smoothened potential landscape. So batch normalization would be another thing, right? So, so we, we can have, okay, so how would, you, how would we test this hypothesis that, uh, that, you know, because for the moment I can hand wave almost anything, right? I'm, I'm trying to tell you that, you know, all those things you can think as that they're smoothing the potential landscape. So how would you test it? Well, you know, one way it would be to, to compute some objective characteristics of the landscape you know, basically try to sort of functionally, but it's very difficult because you, you never have the landscape, you know, nobody, like, you, you know, people draw a picture of the landscape, but you actually never have it, right? Like, it's, a, it's an extremely difficult computational problem to get the landscape. And you would certainly never do it in order to train a model. But one way you could, you, you could test it is the following. Well, you know that you're supposed to be diffusing in that landscape, and, and diffusion has, you know, the, you know, that's what, your, what, that's what uh, this gradient descent equation does, right? It basically, uh, you know, makes you diffuse in that landscape in, in some, you know, noisy circumstances. So what you could do is, is to try to see how far away you diffuse from your initial starting point, right? In, if, you, if you diffuse in a flat landscape, then you'll diffuse far away in the same amount of time. And if you diffuse in a very random landscape, then you quickly get trapped somewhere and that's it, right? So, so, so your, your distance will not be growing as fast. Okay, so there is a there is a well-defined relation, sort of mathematical relation between your your you know there is a diff, there's the diffusion curve that you can plot, and you can you can basically parameterize uh, this this level of of temperature of noise whatever by examining the diffusion curves, right? So so let us convince ourselves that if we train the model at various parameter, then we obtain diffusion curves which tell us that we really looks like we're diffusing in a flatter landscape, or, or looks like we're diffusing diffusing in in a in a sort of more rough landscape. So here is, for example, this, this thing for, for dropout. Actually, this, so, so this is the retention rate. This is how many, how many of them you keep. And then what should happen is that the, the noise should be proportional to inverse retention rate. So, uh, and, and you see that indeed uh, uh, you, you diffuse. So this is, this is you know, the mini batch steps, and that's the distance that you covered. So you really see that at largest retention rate, you diffuse the furthest. Right, so that's something for dropout. It's, you know, dropout is maybe less, uh, uh, you know, 
it's maybe slightly more difficult to to get this intuition that dropout the dropout is is really uh, helping you to flatten but again via, via this intuition of noise that, that works but here we have a proof learning rate is something for, for which it's kind of easy to understand that you know large learning rate is large noise and therefore it's like and turn again if i increase the learning rate i diffuse much much faster okay so 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 really empirically i can see that it looks as if i'm diffusing in effectively a, a flatter potential okay Fine. What about the, the L2? I said the L2 can also think be thought about, you know, of, of suppressing potential fluctuations, so it's good. So you see L2, there's something fishy about L2, right? Because on the one hand, if you look at which curve is the steepest, it's the blue curve. It's the one with largest L2 regularization, right? So initially it looks like it's going the fastest. But then you know, L2 has this effect that at the end of the day, it produces an effective plateau, right? You're not, it, it constrains the weight to, to a certain hypersphere and you cannot grow outside of that. So basically, at some point, everybody plateaus. So for, for the purpose of the algorithm that I'll now try to describe, L2 is not good because what, what we actually want is we want like an ensemble of copies of the model which diffuse at different speeds. And with L2, at some point, they will effectively all be stuck. I mean, for very small ones, not, but, but for slightly larger, yes. So, you know, those are, for example, good hyperparameters for us, and also, like I say, batch size, batch normalization, all those things can be can be used. And this one, I you know, I, I, you can do it, but I don't expect any gains uh, for it. Okay, so for the algorithm, I, I need to this will this will come you know this will need some physical intuition, and and in order to do that, I, I'll tell you just one slide about Monte Carlo sampling. So, is anybody familiar with Monte Carlo sampling, or everyone is familiar with Monte Carlo sampling? Yes, no, a bit. Okay. You get a slide. So, uh, the ba you know, so that we're all at the same basic level. So, so the basic idea of Monte Carlo sampling is that you have some process which generates a string of samples, and the idea is that the way you do it is that at long times the distribution of this of the samples generated by your process reproduces the distribution that you're interested in. Okay, and and how to do it? Well, so so how you know what what is kind of the real description of the process? You there is some chain, it's, you know, normally one does something which is called Markov chain Monte Carlo. And there's this Markov property which, which, which says that I, you know, my, my, my next sample will only depend on my previous sample and not on the past history. I don't remember any history. So I'm basically pro proposing with some probability what is, going to, what is going to be my next sample, okay? And in order to actually have a correct probability distribution, you know, there has to be something which ties my proposal to the actual distribution that I am interested in. Right? Because otherwise, why would it converge to one particular distribution and not something else? And there's the second step, which is really important, which is that I accept or reject my proposal with probability, which is proportional to the ratio. So, so L is, let's say, the probability distribution that I'm targeting. And I'm basically just comparing, okay, what was the probability distribution of my previous sample compared to probability, probability of my you know, proposed sample? And if this ratio is good, then I accept it. And if it's bad, then I sometimes accept and sometimes not. I, I do this kind of rejection procedure. So there is a there's a nice kind of you know kind of cartoon, right? That you know that's that's kind of the probability distribution that you that you target. And then you say, okay, I this is my some initial starting state. And then I propose to to move to this left, you know, this point, right? And this point is more probable than the one I had under this probability distribution. So I accept it. And you know then I then I propose this move, it's also more probable than the one that I had, so I accept it. This move is less probable, so I actually reject it, but sometimes I can also, sometimes I can accept. So, so if, if it proposes me a sample which is less probable than the one that I had, then with particularly fine-tuned probability, I can still accept it. That allows me to, to kind of explore the, this kind of corners of the distribution, okay? And if you actually perform this kind of process with you know, this procedure correctly tuned, then you see that what you'll get is, is effectively this uh, probability distribution that you're interested in. So I don't know again how familiar you are with Monte Carlo methods, but effectively, if you want to sample from high dimensional distributions, that's, that's more or less the only method that's available to you. Like uh, uh, almost no other, no other method is able to sample multi-dimensional distributions very well. And again, something very interesting, how was Monte Carlo developed? Monte Carlo, you know, Monte Carlo and, uh, and evaluating functions about Monte Carlo was really developed in the, in the context of Manhattan Project. So, so in the context of trying to build atomic bombs. So it's, it's really done by like, you know, some of the most prominent physicists 60, 70 years ago. 
Uh, Ulam you say yes indeed so so Stanislav Ulam is uh, is actually one of uh, one well I mean it has the name of uh, Teller and, 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 and Metropolis attached, attached to it but okay Ulam was the first guy to have proposed to use Mont so you know to, to generate such random samples according to sample distribution and to use it to integrate you know if you want to compute numerically some difficult integral for example something related to you know how much neutrons you're going to get in your nuclear device that you're trying to construct then you know Either you can kind of do it exactly, but you cannot, or you have some numerical way. And he had this very brilliant idea that, that if you're able to just randomly sample this function, that, you, that you're going to get something that converges to the true, uh, true value very well. So, yeah. Okay, but so, so how would you design, you know, you need to, for this process, you need to design this, the P, and you need to design this acceptance uh, uh, step, okay? So how do you do it? There are two requirements. One of them is called the detailed balance, it's basically saying that the flux of, you know, like if you're in, a, in any given state, which has, you know, some probability distribution, and you're proposing some moves. So it's basically saying you, that the probability of, of you moving to some other corner of the phase space is, is, is the same as, as the probability of you coming back. So that means that, that your process, you know, exploring this, this phase space of this probability distribution, it will not somehow preferentially end up in the left corner. There is the same chance of ending up here and then going back. Uh, so the, and, and the other the other one is is uh, called ergodicity. So what you need to ensure that whatever process you design, it has the chance to see the whole space. So that this will guarantee you that the distribution that you that you're trying to converge to will be unique. So, so that you're going to get what you want. Okay. And there is a okay. Wait. And there is, so I didn't write it because it will appear later. But there is a sort of a, a way to. Uh, to construct, you know, a very simple uh, acceptance, so it's very simple probability, this, this function that ensures this for, for, you know, for, for a generic problem. So it's called metropolis hasting algorithm. It's something that takes literally four lines of code to do. So after all this kind of complicated introduction, you, you can go and you can write it in four lines, okay? Uh, and and I, I will give you the acceptance. Okay, so with that, we can, we can now, like, we have all the ingredients, so that we, can, we can do the algorithm, right? So, so what do we have? We said, we want to exploit the fact that the potential landscape at various values of hyperparameters looks smoother or rougher, right? So what we do is we construct an ensemble of those potential landscapes. So basically a set of models with different hyperparameters, okay? And, and so, so they, they are distributed according to these probability distributions with varying, you know, because, because hyperparameters are different, the noise is different, so the temperature is different. So they're according, they, they are all both distributed according to your energy function, but at different temperatures, okay? So what's the effect of that? So I have, I have let's say, three landscapes like this. Now, and in the spirit of, of kind of Monte Carlo, right, when I, uh, when I now propose some, some moves, it's much easier for, for me to propose and be accepted to make a move which actually jumps, you know, the, the, the proposal, the, the, the probability of accepting any move depends on the energy difference between the, you know, it, you see, you, you saw that it depends on the ratio of this L1 to L2. It depends on the ratio of the probabilities, which in this case means it, the, the difference between energy. So if I propose a move from a state, which is, for example, here to a state, which is here, the energy difference between them is pretty large, and most probably it will be rejected. My procedure will be proposing this move. I will never, ever go there. And maybe I need to go here because, you know, somewhere down there, there is a really good parameter area. So I first need to jump over that barrier in order to get somewhere else, right? But if you see that in, in this flattened landscape, my, pro you know, my, my proposal, let's say, to jump from here to here will be accepted with much larger probability because the energy difference between those two things is actually very small, okay? So, so all those moves, let's say, it could be you know, equally probable. Like the small, move, the small move here might have the same probability as a big move here, okay? So, but now I, have, now I have an ensemble of those models. And you know, I can I can think that I'm training, you know, a full set of them simultaneously. So what I have is like there is some there's, you know, there is a full probability of the system, which is a product of all of them. Okay, but they're independent at the moment. Nobody talks to anyone. There's there's no there's no couple, right? So what's the, what's the idea? Okay, now now comes this point that we've been you know, alluding to from the very beginning. We want to make them talk to each other. We want to couple them. So couple the what what's called the replicas, right? How do you do it? Now you basically say, okay, uh, 
the Monte Carlo idea doesn't have to work on the level of a single chain that I'm trying to sample from this probability distribution. It can also work on the level of, of this product probability distribution. I'm trying to sample from this John. So I want to reproduce the full, the full probability distribution and I can allow myself to make those proposed moves, not only within the chain, but between the chains. So I basically allowed to, you know, let's say, you know, explore, explore this potential landscape, and then with some probability propose, oh, let me now move to the flattened landscape, and let's make a few moves in the flattened landscape before going back to my original one. But you see what happens. For example, this allows me, let's say I make 10 moves here, and I can get, get, get out of here. Then I, then I, let's say, jump here, and here I have some probability of jumping over that barrier, and then I move, make, say, make 10 moves over here, and then maybe I go back here, back here. At the end of the day, I end up here, right? Whereas in this original landscape, I never had the chance to, to jump over that barrier over here, right? So what we, what we do is exactly we design an algorithm that, that does this. So we, we construct this kind of accept, so I, I will not now go to the other format. So we construct this acceptance probabilities for jumping between the replicas, and it's done in a generic way. So the, the, the amazing thing about this is like you don't need to know anything about the landscape, anything more than, than what you have. You just need to have your cost function, that's it. There's, there's a simple prescription to do it. And you design some acceptance criteria, which basically says, whenever I'm lowering my energy, I take it. And if I'm raising my energy, then I take it, but with exponential, sort of exponentially small probability. Sometimes I, I accept even moves will jump over the barriers and moves that go between the chains, okay? And what we do is, okay, so, so this, is the final, this is the final sort of theoretical flight. There's, there's an algorithm. The algorithm basically what it does is it initializes a bunch of chains that now, now they don't really do Monte Carlo, right? They, they, root, they do, they're all graded in the sense, all of them for different hyperparameters. And periodically, they, with, with this kind of acceptance probability that was there, you know, that's related to this Monte Carlo, they, you know, a model which is, you know, it's, let's say, that this model starts at, at some weights W. After 100 steps, it's at, it's at, you know, W100. But it was doing it under, say, let's say learning rate of 0.1. And now it's allowed to say, okay, I'm exchanging my hyperparameter value with the other replica. So I'm, I'm suddenly feeling like my learning rate is let's say now 0.2. And the guy who had 0.2 now has 0.1. And they continue their evolution. And they can, they can exchange it. There's a bunch of those chains and they, they, can, they can all exchange it with some probability, okay? So you're training this ensemble of, of guys who, who swap their hyperparameters all the time, okay? And at the end of the day, you know, you let it run just as, as you would normally, and you look at, you know, the best guy. But the best guy, you see, it's, 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 he never stayed within his own hyperparameter value. He has a whole history of jumping all over the place, okay? So let's test it. So what we did is, uh, so when I, say, when I say we, I mean Vlad. Uh, uh, so we, we tested it on MNIST, so that's extended, extended MNIST, so you have uh, letters instead of, instead of numbers and on CIFAR, CIFAR 10 data set. And we let it run on, on Lenitz. Uh, do you remember which size, 10? There's a, okay, there's, let, let, there's a bunch of them, but maybe you can, you can check which ones exactly. Uh, so, this is the so this is our first, first test model. So the first one, so this, this, is, uh, this is this Lenitz problem. Okay. Lenin. Let's say this is okay. This is Lenin tested for uh, various values. Of, so, so this is this procedure for dropout. So, so there is a, there is a bunch of replicas with different dropout rates, uh, and this is the, the first one is uh, on. Let's see, let's see, sorry. Uh, okay, so one one of so I think this this is. Uh, sorry, now I need to check it because there's four pictures. Which one is this? Is in, is Okay. Sorry. Spoiler alert, yes. Uh, yes. Okay, uh, so this will be MNIST in the MNIST in the top row. And this was actually MNIST. And then the bottom row was CIFAR. Yes. And so if you can then check. The were...
uh, we need help, technical help to bring back the slides. We don't want to come back. It's approximately eight layers, so it's good to take into account that holding. Yeah. Uh, probably there was a remote somewhere, right? I uh, I still connected to Zoom. I don't know. Question: Have you connected? No, I, I was never connected. Uh, yeah, that seems that seems correct. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Amnist. Okay. Let it amnist. So, so you see. Okay. Then, then <coughs> you get you get lower errors on 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 both of them. This so this is for this is for dropout. So one of those curves is. Is the optimal value of dropout that you do by let's say you know just just searching quite hard for it. The other one is a bunch of bunch of replicas in a window that, that talk to each other. You see that you know you get better answers. You get the same the same happens for uh, for uh, this this was uh, with learning right. Uh, and then you can do the same for uh, CFR10 again same Lennets CFR10 for dropout and for uh, learning. Actually, one, one actually five, five. Yeah, so Lennet 5. Okay, yeah. So this, this was Lennet 5. And then we also tried, uh, we also tried this on, on, on ResNet. So we have, uh, yeah, okay. It's already pretty late, so maybe no, no description. I suppose you are familiar with ResNet, right? It's, you introduce, you know, it's, it's basically multi layer networks in which you introduce those shortcuts, right? Where, you, where your activation function gets direct inputs from, from the user. That basically is supposed to solve this problem that it's hard to train deep networks because your gradients vanish. So, so ResNets again are, so this is basically, okay, it's supposed to work better. Uh, and so this is a, a result for, for ResNet 20 and, and ResNet 44 uh, on CIFAR. Uh, and again, you, so you see that's, that's uh, you know, the, the optimal trained value of, of some ResNets versus the one that's obtained by, by this algorithm. Uh, okay, some numerical results. So you see, the, you get okay. The, the improvement isn't at the moment uh, that huge, but you consistently uh, get below. And I, I think that if you kind of tune this procedure better, then you can still uh, do it better. And I, here, yeah. it's, you actually go below, but else you it's much simpler. So it gives you like to find the best values which are watch the curves. It's actually like extensive search. Yeah, so the, you know, if you wanted to sell it, you know, there's there's also some some other ways to to look at it. Uh, so, so, for instance, you know, you, you see sometimes that you that you get to the same uh, learn uh, you know error rates faster, like it, it actually trains faster uh, than. And we also saw, you know, we're we're not sure, but there there seem to be some hints that it may maybe. Uh, mm, would for reducing the generalization gap, uh, but but we, we need to explore it. And so here, finally, like this is pretty much the you know one of the last slides. I just want to show you the the the, the, the sort of trajectory that, that this thing happened. Right. So you had a bunch of replicas. I don't remember which hyperparameter that, that was, but you see there's a bunch of guys that sort of initialize somewhere, and they all start running at their individual uh, uh, hyperparameter. But then they, they you know this is in the number of, of epochs. Uh, uh, sorry, in the number of, of uh, you know, epochs. They, they periodically make make some changes, right? And you see that those trajectories are fairly complicated, and the, the, the gray, the, the one in gray, is the one which is ultimately was the winning one, right? So, so this is the guy who you know went up somewhere here, then did something like this, and finally, you know, this is the guy who actually uh, you know finally had the best performance. Uh, okay, so again, like the like the conceptual the conceptual way to to think of it is that. Instead of let's say being confined to some hyperplane and doing some gradients and this, you are actually doing some moves outside this hyperplane, right? Connecting between between others, and perhaps you know this way you you know you 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 escape some minima, but somehow it seems to work, right? Uh, 
So this is the last slide, uh, uh, Outlook or other things that we're doing. So we're also, I know that's mostly if you want to work with Mikoa. Uh, so we're also thinking about uh, training binary networks using, using sort of statistical physics methods. Uh, we have some very vague ideas of uh, trying to uh, improve reinforcement learning with, with similar ideas related to, uh, this is called parallel tempering, this kind of having replicas that talk to each other. And, and finally, uh, I sort of in my much more physics incarnation, I, I do uh, things like, uh, well, which are more related to, to uh, physics of disordered systems and something which is called renormalization group. But we also try to connect it to some, some machine learning. So we try to actually use some machine learning techniques in, in, uh, as opposed to deploy this to machine learning. Although you might have heard that some people also like to think of deep neural networks as performing some RG. Okay. Thanks a lot for your attention. I, I went a little bit over time, but I hope you know just. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, what about this approach of keeping neural networks? Because it would be very costly to train several networks that are like two big networks that are exchanging the parameters multiple times. Well, so it's not, I, I would say it's, it's not particularly more expensive than, the, than what you have to do at this point anyways, right? Because you still have to train multiple copies of this for different values hyperparameters. It's just that you mostly discard those, those previous computations. Mm -hmm. So here you, you, you don't actually have to do much more because this step of, of allowing them to talk to each other is actually computationally almost negligible. It's almost a constant cost. Uh, you know, you, you, you can put each one of them on a separate GPU and let's say once every hundred epochs, or once every thousand epochs, you just, you just swap one number. Like the, the, you, know, you don't change the parameters, you don't transfer any data. You just say, like, now this guy has a learning rate of 0 0.2 and this guy has 0 0.1. So you only, like every so many epochs, you need to switch two numbers. And, and, and you switch it according to probability that you, that you don't need to estimate. You compute it from a, for, from, a, from a formula. Like you look at your previous value of your cost function in, in the previous iteration evaluation, and you compare it with, with what you have now. And that's, this is the number that's used to estimate, to, to define the probability of you doing that swap. So, so basically almost all that you need for that, you already have anyways. So, so it's not, training deep network is costly. But, but in general, uh, and, and, but this doesn't make it actually more cost. It's pretty much the same cost. Well, I don't, I don't know why I would do this, but it seems to me that if, if I try to do this, then it's that by interaction, it seems like I would probably bias the other guy too. Yeah, uh, but the bigger number of the models would be biased. Yeah. They yes, so this is probably them. this is probably true. But uh, the, I mean, uh, do you want do you want to do this? You think you want to do this intentionally, or you're, you're worrying that no, this no, might yeah, happen? I'm worried. But for, for what, why, why they would be, in what sense they would be biased? Why, why, what? It would be unfair, for example. They will, uh, like, in this example, two models will, mm -hmm. will be unfair in some classification, and right. the third model will become unfair. Yeah, so. So part of so part of the part of part of part of what you do here, right, is is that by this um, by this argument, I, mean, I you have to get a little bit more into detail. But the point is that that you're kind of really just flattening the landscape and you're not really changing it. So so you're you're not introducing biases to your probability distribution. Actually, it's one of the one of the things that's actually quite important in this method. Right, that, that's why they use it for let's say protein folding, whatever. Is is that it 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 faithfully keeps all the probability distributions. It doesn't. You, no, you don't introduce biases by this. If there are some biases for other reason, that, that, but, but this doesn't introduce any biases. So you faithfully, like if you had infinite amount of time, here you would faithfully reproduce all those probability distributions. You, you would convert mathematically guaranteed. So. 
Uh, yes, one, one question uh, regarding initial set of parameters. You, in the beginning, uh, set a fixed amount of different parameters and then they try to exchange. So is there any like suggestion of which one to choose or? Perfect, I, that's, that's, actually, that's actually a super good question, right? So actually that's, that's, the, that's the shortcoming of, of this uh, for the moment, right? Because we, you know, the way we would want to, like it's, now it's a research project, so we don't, it's not uh, you know written down as a, as a code that you should opt, you know use for your your investment. So if it if it were to be a practical project, right? What we should also do is is provide a, a sort of a, a procedure for how to choose the the, the replicas, right? Uh, uh, you know how to choose those initial values of, of parameters to to talk to each other, right? And and uh, there are some you know there are some physical insights. So so again, thinking about physics, you can understand what should be the spacing between them. Uh, you know, it's, it's more or less it's related to the fact that everybody's making some fluctuations and what, what, what has to be is that the chance of making fluctuation large enough that you're in energy close to the other guy is, is large, okay? But uh, the, uh, the, the honest answer is that at the moment it's not implemented like this. So, so we don't have a, like an automatic way to, to do it for, for a particular system. At the moment what we do is we more or less know what is the correct uh, area where the parameters are and we basically equally space in, in, that, in that region. Uh, but, but in order for it to be an actual sort of uh, you know, useful practical procedure, one should now also think about, okay, how do you uh, sort of generically uh, you know, produce this? Because obviously you would hope that, you know, may, maybe it's a bit too ambitious because usually you have a vague idea what a parameter is, but maybe you, you also can you know, combine it with like a first procedure to kind of narrow this window and, and then space it properly with those replicas. But it's something to, it's really important to think of this. It depends on your uncertainty of, of you know how much you you're uncertain about where is the bo the, the correct uh, you know area for, for the because you know if you if you don't know anything at all then most probably I think probably first you should kind of narrow down this this, this region and then based on based on this criteria of acceptance like how much you, you know, if you know how much they have to be spaced, then you know how many you need to cover some particular uh, interval. And that depends, and, and how much can be spaced, that depends on your, on your kind of cost function. Uh, yeah, actually, I will also call, call now uh, the space uh, temperatures very much depends on the so-called acceptance rate. So you, you can actually adjust those in the end. So you, like the, the good acceptance rate is like 30 50 percent. You can actually check how often you reject the moves. And if you reject them too often, you actually can like narrow down the stated uh, temperatures or type of parameters. So they will be like uh, cold, they will be colder in energy, so they will be more All those techniques are already developed for this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, when you say, uh, you know, all. Like it's not it's not so it's not so easy, right? Because you know, we, in, in physics, you you most of the time you, you spend all this time to, to simulate one system, right? And most probably you're kind of not doing it, not doing it again, right? So, but but here, what you want is kind of to have some like a generic framework so that you don't have to fine tune it. But I think what also what I want to point out is that the, the funny so so there's this interpretation, right? That that your model has this history, right? So I, actually, even if I so, so it's, it's better even if I know what the optimal value of the parameter is. Because if I, if I, take, so the, the, if I take the model, you know, if, if one of my parameters is the optimal value of hyperparameter, but I allow it to have a bunch of friends around it, and I allow it to train uh, talking to those other guys, it actually gets better than the optimal value. So like this, you know, this kind of more complicated path is better than any straight path. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, the, the, in fact, here this, this is the case, right? One of those replicas is actually the optimal value, uh, and 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 the, the path that exchanges actually beats it. Uh, so, so in that sense, it's it's a little bit more, um, yeah. It's not only about finding the best hyperparameter value because you're at the end of the day, you you don't find any particular hyperparameter value, right? You just train it in in some you know complicated history kind of way. Uh, so if you think of it, you're not parameterized by a single parameter value, you're parameterized by a history of changes. So, you know, like you could say, I, you could say I didn't train my model, but, but you know, you, the thing is, it, it sounds maybe slightly weird, but it's not, right? Because you already, you already have it, right? When you do annealing, right, you, you exactly have this. You say, 
I, I didn't train my model at, at learning rate 0 0.5. I trained it according to a, to a procedure, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, 0. Point whatever, right? That's your, it's parameterized actually by this annealing schedule, right? So here it's parameterized by the exchange schedule. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Oh yeah. No, I, I, ha I haven't. Uh... So uh, you're asking actually if there is an overhead when I introduce the exchange. Yeah. Basically, no. So it's all all the constants. Uh, constants. Yeah. But you, but it's, I think he's what he's saying is that, that you know you kind of have to run them simultaneously, yeah, right? Because you cannot wait on the other guy to. Yeah. So because there's there's else I, well, in some sense, okay, it's not so much important how uh, how often you make the step. It doesn't have to be in a fixed amount of time. It, what's important is that the that the probability of of accepting is correct. Mm -hmm. So, so, so I think it's perfectly fine that somebody's lagging behind. So you don't make the move when you intend it. As long as when you make the move, it's made with the correct probability. And that's, that's something that actually, so you do moves in this amount of hours. So you actually need to, uh, to be sure that you kind of equilibrate it well, so your uh, move doesn't kind of get numbers. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, unless you're equilibrated or something. Yeah. So in this case, that's an answer. Well, yeah, yeah it's, 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 so it's a very good question. So, so that's actually something that we want to do. Uh, we haven't, right? We, we kind of exchange information about one parameter, but you can try to think, can I, can I, can I make it those path even more multidimensional? So let's say I, I, I change simultaneously the, the learning rate and the dropout. Uh, and the answer is, I think sure, because uh, because in in physics this is done. So so in in specifically in simulations of of protein folding, where where this method is uh, is also deployed, people do it. So the people do this kind of uh, they call multi-dimensional replicas. Yeah. So so you have to think that yes, you you have a bunch of parameters, each one of them in some way, in some but but sort of controlled way. Uh, uh, you know, uh, influences the smoothness of the potential, and these are dropout does it, and learning rate does it, whatever. And you can more, you, you can consist. You know, mathematically, it's not a problem to introduce those probability distributions. It's it's more like a, you know, problem of for the moment of, of writing it and, and testing it. But conceptually, you can do it, and it's done in in physics. I mean, it's but it's not a like it's it's probably not so difficult, but it's again, it's not a technique that. Uh, you know that everybody uses, right? It, this this is sort of a fairly fairly sophisticated, uh, you know, method that's used in a very kind of specific corner of, of simulation. So perhaps that's why it's not so widespread. Uh, but it doesn't. It's, it's very, you know, it's 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 this probably state of the art. But uh, but like I say, it's not known. It's it's just diffusion of knowledge, right? I mean, there are people who do this kind of stuff, right? You know, like if you. If you, for example, ask when was first this parallel tempering method developed, it was developed in 86 for spin systems. And until probably end of, end of let's say, you know, 90s, it was probably not applied to anything else. Until, let's say, people who started doing protein folding realized, oh, we kind of, our problem is the spin systems are also like this complicated landscape. We have complicated landscape. Why don't we do this? Okay, you know, 10, 10 years later, you know, may maybe now we can do it with machine learning. Right? Any more questions? Or if, if there are any questions, we can still talk. For several more minutes, we are here. Thanks sure. so much. Thanks a lot for the time. Thank you. Thank you, Pachi.
Thank you, Mikwa. Thank you. 